I don't think that, you know, this word only teaching about the Holy Spirit is a fellowship issue, but I mean, here's the problem. How does the Holy Spirit dwell in Christians? And how does the Holy Spirit exert his influence on the heart of a Christian as they pursue holiness? These have always been controversial questions in Churches of Christ. But in recent days, debate has reignited, especially online, about these questions. And I'd like to share with you what I believe the New Testament to teach and answer to the questions. But before I do, I hope that you'll indulge me. I just want to tell you uh, my own personal journey as I've sorted through this debate and these questions. And at the end of the video, I would like to share with you some of my concerns about some of the positions that are now being taken in regard to the answer to these questions. And so I have to warn you at the outset, you know, this is going to be maybe a little bit rambling. It's going to be personal. I don't have this all scripted out. This is just what I'm thinking at this moment uh, as the debate is taking place. So I didn't grow up in Churches of Christ. Uh, I actually grew up in the Baptist Church. And my chemistry teacher, my junior year of high school, his name's Trevor Copeland, uh, he studied the book of Acts with me and showed me baptism's place in the plan of salvation. And he baptized me. And soon after my baptism, I became very close to the personal evangelism minister there at my home congregation in Dexter, Missouri. His name was Dale Grissom. And Brother Dale, I mean, he was just the best person. Um, he blessed me in so many ways. And um, many days when I would get out of school, I would go from school to the church building and just sit and study with Brother Dale. He taught me so much. But he early on taught me his conviction concerning the manner of the Holy Spirit's indwelling and influence in the life of a Christian. He held the word only view. And he thought the best material had been produced by Guy Woods and gave me a tract that Guy Woods wrote on the question and also loaned me his copies of Guy Woods' Question and Answers, Volume 1 and 2, and encouraged me to read them. And Brother Dale had me convinced of the word-only view. Well, at the end of my junior year, the uh, pulpit minister there at the Dexter Church of Christ, Jim Fawn, um, he left and so during that summer and throughout the beginning part of my senior year, uh, we were looking for a preacher. And so men of the congregation would fill in. And uh, the brethren there, surprisingly, were so patient and so um, encouraging in my growth, they actually let me preach some Sunday nights, even though I'd only been a Christian for a few months. And what did I do? Well, of course, I preached on the Holy Spirit, <laughs> foolishly. I didn't know enough to preach on the Holy Spirit, but I did. And basically what I did was just regurgitate Guy Wood's material. And um, I remember I made a chart out of a, a big poster board in which I put um, activities and verses showing what the Word of God does. And then in another column, activities and verses showing what the Holy Spirit does. And, you know, made the argument that, the Holy Spirit always works through the Word. Well, after I would made this presentation, another brother in the congregation who actually was a medical doctor, he approached me and very graciously encouraged me to study more on the subject of the Holy Spirit because he held to the personal view uh, of the Spirit's indwelling. And he gave me some materials, but didn't convince me because I had more confidence in that time in Brother Dale. Well, uh, my senior year, uh, one of the elders there at the congregation and uh, his wife, uh, they were so good to me, and they took me with them to the Freed Hardeman Lectureship. So I, I uh, got out of school a whole week my senior year and went to the Freed Lectureship. And that was during the time when Alan Hires was moderator of the Open Forum. And... Uh, Brother Hires that particular year invited Hardeman Nichols to come and be a co-moderator with him on the open forum. And so in years past, Guy Woods, who held the representative view of the indwelling, and Gus Nichols, who held the personal view of the indwelling, uh, they would debate that question uh, every 
year on the open forum. And so uh, that first open forum that I attended, Alan Hires and Hardiman Nichols debated the question of the nature of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Alan Hires holding to the representative view and Hardiman Nichols holding the personal view that his dad had held. And I was so impressed with the way that Hardiman Nichols uh, presented the scriptural case for the personal indwelling, I was convinced. I, I thought that um, he had the better argument over Alan Hires, which, you know, much love to Brother Hires. And in fact, I was so impressed with Hardiman Nichols that whenever my firstborn son was born, I named him Jacob Hardiman after Hardiman Nichols. Now, of course, Hardiman Nichols had been named after Nicholas Brody Hardiman, N.B. Hardiman, but I named my son after Hardiman Nichols. Well, I held that personal indwelling view for several years. I went to Freed Hardiman and I went to, to uh, Memphis School of Preaching. And when I was at Memphis School of Preaching, I took the Holy Spirit class under Keith Mosier. And Keith Mosier, of course, holds to the representative indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And his position in many ways is uh, similar to that of Franklin Camp. And there are differences, I know, but it's similar in many ways. And you can find uh, multiple videos on YouTube of um, Keith Mosier presenting his view of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, Brother Mosier, I think, is just a master teacher. And, um, you know, I loved all the teachers that I had at Memphis School of Preaching, including Curtis Cates and Garland Elkins and Bobby Liddell and, and Billy Bland. But Brother Mosier was my favorite. And so he absolutely convinced me of that position. Now, I was there at Memphis during the time when uh, there was a lot of controversy concerning Mac Deaver. Mac Deaver had become... Um, somewhat of a lightning rod because uh, he believed that uh, it was incumbent upon him to try to promote the teaching of the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, like Gus Nichols had taught. But uh, Mac Deaver went a step farther, and Mac Deaver believed that it wasn't just the case that the Spirit dwells in us but doesn't do anything. It, you know, it's not just the case that the Holy Spirit is hibernating in us. Rather, MacDeaver believed that the Holy Spirit personally helps us, that there is spirit-on-spirit -spirit help. Uh, now, it's not separate and apart from the Word. It's only in a heart that is under the influence of the Word, so it's in conjunction with the Word, but it's not, strictly speaking, through the Word. And uh, while I was at Memphis School of Preaching, MacDeaver was labeled a false teacher. And uh, that was presented as uh, though it were damnable false doctrine. And so, you know, it, it, was, it was believed. I don't, none of the instructors at Memphis School of Preaching held to the personal indwelling. Now, they didn't consider the personal indwelling to be um, a fellowship issue. They thought that holding the personal indwelling uh, could lead you into some dangerous places. And so they thought you're vulnerable if you held the view, but they did teach that if you go that next step and believe that the Spirit uh, directly strengthens you, that that is damnable false doctrine. Now, interesting point, what Mac Deaver was saying in those days was the same thing that Thomas B. Warren had held for years. And in fact, uh, if you look on the Progressive Primitivist uh, YouTube channel, you'll find there a video that presents the audio of uh, an open forum that took place in 1967 in which Thomas Warren and Guy Woods debate the subject. And Thomas Warren you know, argues for the personal indwelling, but then he argues that passages like Ephesians 3.16 where Paul prayed that God would strengthen the Christians with might through His Spirit in their inner man, that that teaches that there is this um, spirit-on-spirit spirit help that the Holy Spirit gives. And, you know, nobody withdrew fellowship from uh, Tom Warren as though Tom Warren were teaching damnable false doctrine, but, you know, they did that with Mac Deaver. So, anyway, um, I was convinced of Brother Mosier's position when I was in Memphis School of Preaching, and I remember when I got out of preacher's school, I was preaching in Spring Hill, Louisiana, 
And uh, there was a debate between Mac Deaver and Jerry Moffitt up in Denton, Texas. I, I traveled to that debate, but um, you know, was thoroughly convinced that Mac Deaver was in the wrong and that Jerry Moffitt was in the right. And so for about a decade, um, I militantly taught that word-only view of the Holy Spirit. And then one day I was studying the book of Ephesians and, and reading Ephesians 4 verse 30 where you know Paul is uh, encouraging the Ephesians to not live as they did when they were pagans, but to put on the new man in Christ. And you know he goes through those uh, practical commands as to how they're to treat one another and he forbids them uh, from uh, abusing one another with their speech, last verse 30, they grieve or they vex the Holy Spirit of God. And then Paul says, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, I had believed that the sealing was a miraculous gift. And that's what I was taught at Memphis. That was, that was Brother Mosher's position. And the argument Brother Mosher made was that a seal is something that's visible. In the ancient world, if you seal a document, you take hot wax and you put it on that document and then you uh, impress that hot wax with your signet ring and you leave your impression on it. And, and that visible seal says that you know this document is official and you've got to have authorization in order to open it. You know, uh, that, that, that visible seal shows, shows ownership. And so if we're sealed with the Spirit, it's got to be something that you can see. And so he argued that it was miraculous gifts. He linked up Ephesians 4.30 and also Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, where again, Paul says the Ephesians are sealed, and he would link that up to Acts chapter 19 verses 1 to 7, where you know, Paul came to Ephesus and he finds those 12 Ephesians who had been baptized with John's baptism, presumably by Apollos. And so you know, Paul teaches them more correctly about baptism, and then after he baptizes them into Christ, verse 6 says that Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them. Some manuscripts say he fell on them. And then they began to speak with tongues and to prophesy. And so Brother Moser said the speaking in tongues and the prophesying, that was something that was visible. That was God's visible sign. That was God's visible seal that they were God's people. And he said that is what the seal is. But, you know, of course... I believe then and I believe now that those uh, miraculous spiritual gifts that were given through the laying on of an apostle's hands, you know, outlined in passages like 1 Corinthians 12 verses 8 through 10, I believe that those were temporary, that those gifts served a temporary need of the church whenever they were without a New Testament and, you know, they needed the truth revealed and they needed the truth confirmed, but once everybody upon whom an apostle laid their hands died and the apostles died, those spiritual gifts ceased from the church. Now, if that's the case, then the sealing at that time would cease from the church. But on this occasion, as I was reading Ephesians 4.30, I saw, you know, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And I noticed that this sealing, it serves a purpose for the day of redemption. This is something that is relevant for all of God's people. This is something that all of God's people need from the first century until the day of redemption. And of course, the day of redemption is a reference to the day of Jesus' second coming, the last day. When Jesus, with his uh, uh, power over death, will issue the command and our bodies, the bodies of Christians, will be reunited with their spirits and will come up out of the grave glorified, bearing the image of Jesus' resurrection body, and they will be redeemed. Our bodies will be redeemed. That is the day of redemption. And so, uh, you know, if Christians are sealed for the day of redemption, then it seems like that seal has got to be something other than a visible, miraculous gift. So, you know, when I made that discovery, I thought, I need to go back and restudy this subject concerning the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so I went back to, uh, to Acts. And, you know, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 famously says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, the position that I had held was the position that I was taught by Brother Mosier and actually the position that Guy Woods held is that that is not a gift which is the Holy Spirit, but that is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. And what it is, is a miraculous spiritual gift given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And in fact, Brother Mosier taught us that grammatically, um, it is not possible for that genitive phrase you know, of the Holy Spirit for that to uh, restate the, the gift, to, to uh, say what the gift is in different words. He said it can't be, uh, his words, an ep exegetical genitive. But, but then as I studied more, I realized, well, actually there are ep exegetical genitives in the New Testament. You know, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, uh, Jesus tells the church to be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Well, there it's not a crown that belongs to life, but it's the crown which is life. Or uh, think of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 where Paul uh, encourages the church to uh, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Bond of peace. Well, there, the bond is not a bond that belongs to peace. The bond is peace. And so, you know, why can't gift of the Holy Spirit mean the gift which is the Holy Spirit? And, you know, I remember that in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, as Peter's preaching, he says, and we're witnesses of, of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. And so, you know, obeying Him, that sounds like repenting and being baptized. And so, you know, those who obey Him, those who repent and are baptized, they get the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. And, you know, Sometimes it's argued, and, and I mean, I argued, that, well, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That, that can't have reference to just a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, in someone's heart because the whole context is miraculous. If you were there that day and you heard all the commotion with the apostles, you know, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you heard the apostles speaking in other tongues, and you saw those uh, tongues of fire sitting over each apostle's head. Uh, you know, what would you think of when you hear Holy Spirit, gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 38? You would think of the miraculous. And, you know, of course, you've got uh, Peter's prophecy that, you know, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And those in the last days, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see visions, your young men shall dream dreams. And so, when they hear gift of the Holy Spirit in verse 38, they would just think of the miraculous. But you know, as I thought about that more, I saw a problem. And the problem is that in the Old Testament, the prophecies of the coming of the Holy Spirit in the New Covenant age don't just concern a miraculous work of the Spirit. There are prophecies that also speak of a moral work of the Spirit. For instance, Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27 says that um, I will put my spirit in you and will move you to keep my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Now that, God putting the spirit you know, in people was for the purpose of strengthening them to do his will. And that, that's a prophecy concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, why couldn't the people on the day of Pentecost think of that passage? Uh, they're devout Jews, aren't they, from every nation under heaven? Acts chapter 2, verse 5, they're familiar with the Old Covenant. I mean, uh, Peter quotes freely from the Old Testament. Uh, he quotes, you know, Joel chapter 2, you know, introducing that quotation from Joel 2 with a phrase from Isaiah 2, 2, you know, it'll come to pass in the last days. That's not Joel 2, 28. That's Isaiah 2, 2. So he, so he combines those two quotations. Uh, you know, he uh, quotes from Psalm 16. He quotes from Psalm uh, 110. I mean, these are people that he assumes are familiar with the Old Testament. Why wouldn't they be familiar with Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27? And so why wouldn't they think of this 
outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of helping people to be moral? Well, I think it's very likely that they did. And then if you look at the next verse, that is Acts 2 verse 39, you know, after Peter promises forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit to all who will repent and be baptized, he says in verse 39, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so as I thought about that more, I thought, my, that, that just doesn't seem consistent with this view that the gift of the Holy Spirit is just a miraculous gift given with the laying on of the apostles' hands. Because, you know, that's not a gift that every person who is called by the gospel and who repents and is baptized receives. That was a gift that only those who saw an apostle face to face throughout the lifetime of the apostles. So, you know, you're limited to uh, the first century and maybe a little bit beyond the first century. I mean, tradition says that the apostle John lived into the reign of Trajan. So, what, 98 to 117 AD? So, so maybe early second century. You know, this if that's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is, then it's, it's limited to that time frame. But Acts 2 verse 39 says the promise, and I, I see no reason why the promise should be limited to, say, forgiveness of sins. <laughs> I mean, in that passage, forgiveness of sins is the purpose for baptism. The promise of the passage is, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so it just seems to me that the gift of the Holy Spirit is promise to all who will be called by the gospel and who will respond to that call by repenting and being baptized. And that is a call that is still continuing today. And that is a, a call that will continue on until Jesus comes again. And so I just don't see how you can limit verse 39. So it just doesn't seem to me that the, the view that the gift of the Holy Spirit is a miraculous gift given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, that that's just consistent with the facts of the case there. But then, you know, I was also reminded of the argument that Tom Warren had made and that Mac Deaver was making. And, Matt, and uh, Tom Warren and Mac Deaver would point out that, you know, in verse 38 of Acts 2, it says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the question is asked, on what side of baptism, before or after, does the gift of the Holy Spirit come? And the answer is after baptism. But then he would drop down to verse 41 where it says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And so the question is asked there, well, on what side of baptism, before or after, the people received the word of God? And the answer is clearly before. And so if they received the word of God before baptism, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit after baptism, how can you say the gift of the Holy Spirit is merely the indwelling of the Spirit representatively through the Word of God? No, no. The gift of the Holy Spirit is something different from receiving the Word of God. They received the Word of God before baptism. They were led by the Word of God to be baptized, and they received the Holy Spirit as a promise upon their baptism. And so... Um, these considerations, I, I just don't think that you can argue that the gift of the Holy Spirit there is a miraculous gift given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Verse 39 forbids that. You can't say that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the uh, figurative indwelling of the Holy Spirit through the representation of the Word of God. Verse 41 forbids that it seems like it must be the Holy Spirit himself. And again, that's consistent with Acts 5.32. We're witness of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to them that obey him. But you know, Tom Warren would also make this point that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit cannot be representative through the Word of God from Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 as well. Because there in Galatians 4, 6, Paul says, Because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And he would say, you know, you see, uh, here, God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts because we're sons. 
And then go back to Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So, so in that passage, it is uh, through faith and baptism that we become the children of God. And then, of course, Galatians 4, 6, because we're the children of God, God sends the spirit of his son into our heart. Now, you know, again, the consideration from Acts 2, when do we receive the word of God? Well, we clearly receive the word of God before we believe and are baptized. We receive the word of God and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God that we receive through hearing the gospel, it leads us to faith and then leads us uh, in obedience into baptism. And it's in baptism that we become sons of God. And then because we are sons of God, God sends the spirit of his son into our hearts. So, so here, again, the sending of the Spirit into your heart and the receiving of the Word of God, they're two separate things. They're not the same thing. But there's something else in that passage that is really significant. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 very closely. So in, in Galatians 4 verse uh, 6, uh, again, Paul says, Because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. Now look at that next word, crying, Abba Father. Now notice what that word is and notice what that word isn't. It's kradzon. It's a participle, a neuter participle, crying. Okay? It, it is not a krods usas. It's not a feminine participle. So you see in the text, it says, you know, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. And the word hearts there is kardios. That's a feminine noun. Crying, kradzon, Abba, Father. So what's crying in the passage? It can't be our hearts. For it to be our hearts, it would have to be krads usas. It would have to be a feminine participle. But it's not. It's kradzon. It's a neuter participle. What is doing the crying in the passage? It's pneuma. It's the spirit, which is a neuter now. And so the spirit that God sends into our hearts, that is the spirit that then cries out, Abba, Father. Now this is related, but it's different from Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. In Romans 8 verse 15, we're told that we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. In, in Romans 8 verse 15, we're the ones crying out, Abba, Father. But in Galatians 4 verse 6, it's the spirit crying in our hearts. So here's the thing. The indwelling of the spirit in our hearts, it's not just the spirit himself hibernating, but doing nothing. No, no. The Spirit in our hearts is doing something. He's, he's crying. He's crying to our hearts, Abba, Father, and He is enabling our hearts then to cry out to God, Romans 8, verse 15, Abba, Father. And so He is having an influence in our hearts. He is giving us assurance. That is something the Spirit is doing in our hearts. I think that's a very important consideration. But then go, go back to the passage that that we started with. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, because there's, I think, a very important point that we need to make here. Here, you know, Paul says, you know, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, most translations say, by whom? And uh, in, in the Greek, it's in ho. You were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, those words, in ho, can be translated three different ways. They could be translated in whom. They could be translated by whom, which I think is what most translations say. Or they could be translated with whom. I mean, that preposition in could carry with it any of those ideas. So, so the question is, which is it? So, um, you know, this, this phrase, in ho, it's not a new expression as you're reading through the book of Ephesians. I mean, its first occurrence is not Ephesians 4 verse 30. You actually find it back in Ephesians chapter 1. 
Um, you know, for instance, uh, Ephesians 1.13 is uh, the first passage that talks about the Holy Spirit sealing, and it says, in ho, the first words, in whom also you having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, um, uh, in whom also having believed or when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, so there, you know, in ho, it does mean in whom. And the whom there, uh, that, uh, pronoun refers to Jesus Christ. And so, you know, it's possible grammatically that Ephesians 4 verse 30 means don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom, that is in the Spirit, you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's possible. And, and in fact, Paul sometimes uses that language of being in the Spirit. Like in Romans chapter 8 he does. He says, um, you know, verse 9, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So, so in whom is possible. But I don't think that's the most likely translation here. Because, again, even though Paul does use, you know, uh, the language of being in the Spirit, he doesn't use that language anywhere else in the book of Ephesians. So then, you know, the second possibility for translating that uh, prepositional phrase, in ho, it, it's by whom. So uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom, that is, by the agency of the Spirit, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, that's a possible translation. But is that the most likely meaning here? And I would suggest to you that it's not. Uh, turn back to Ephesians 1 again. Uh, that passage, verse 13, says again, In whom also you having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, or when you believed, you were sealed. Es fragis theta. So you've got the same word, Ephesians 4, verse 3. You were sealed, and then you've got uh, this expression. It's in the dative case. To penumati teis epangelios to hagio. It could be either by the Holy Spirit of promise, or with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, so here also, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed uh, with or by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, now, which is it? Is it the Holy Spirit of promise that seals us? Or is it that we are sealed uh, by the Holy Spirit of promise or with the Holy Spirit of promise, rather? Look at the next verse. So, verse 14 begins with the neuter pronoun ha. So, um, the, the ha refers back to penumity in verse 13, spirit. Now, you know, ha there is literally which, but of course we know the Holy Spirit is not an it, the Holy Spirit is a he, so it's better to translate it who. Uh, so, the Holy Spirit, who is arabon, who is the down payment, the earnest of our inheritance. So, what this verse is saying is that the Holy Spirit himself is the down payment. It's not that the Holy Spirit gives the down payment. The Holy Spirit himself is the down payment. The grammar won't allow for the idea that the Holy Spirit gives the down payment. So since the Holy Spirit is the down payment himself, verse 14, then verse 13, when it says, you were sealed to penumati, the idea is not you were sealed by the Spirit, you know, as though the, the Spirit is the one who sealed you, but rather it's you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, and then that Holy Spirit, also verse 14, is the down payment of our inheritance. And uh, so notice uh, one other passage that mentions the sealing. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, verse 21 ends with theos, it ends with God, and then Verse 22, referring to God, it says, Hakai uh, Sfragis Amenas. Um, so speaking of God, He is the uh, sealing you and giving you the Arabona to Penumatas in Tais Cardias Hamon. Uh, he is the one who sealed you and given the uh, down payment of the Spirit. So again, here, the Spirit is the down payment in your hearts. So when you look at that, it looks like it's God who seals you. So, in other words, we're, we're discussing the question whether or not that phrase in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, in ho, could be 
could mean there by whom you were sealed. You know, is it the Holy Spirit who sealed you? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it's God who seals and presumably with the Holy Spirit who also then acts as the down payment just as in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. So I think that rules out the possibility that you know this phrase in ho in Ephesians 4 verse 30 means that the Holy Spirit is the agent who seals us. So that, that leaves the uh, other meaning that in ho means um, b or with whom. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So, so in other words, the Holy Spirit is himself the seal. And understand that this would not be the only time in Ephesians that you would have that preposition in uh, meaning with. Let me give you a couple of other instances. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, we're told, uh, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in posse eulagia uh, pneumatike, in tois uh, epuranois in Christo. I don't, I don't know why I read all that, but excuse me. <laughs> it is, uh, uh, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. I mean, they're clearly the, the in posse eulagia, um, you know, with every blessing. It's not in every blessing. It's not by every blessing. God has blessed us with every blessing. Or another instance, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 relative to our singing, we're to be speaking to ourselves and then it is in Psalmois kai humnois kai hodais pneumatikais. So uh, speaking uh, to ourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's not singing to ourselves in, it's not singing to ourselves by, but it's singing to ourselves with, or, or speaking to ourselves with. So I think that's the idea in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. It's don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed. You see, God sealed you with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Now, you, you know, you think about that, uh, you know, if, if a seal is this, um, this wax that's, you know, put on a scroll, for instance, and then imprinted with the signet ring, and that's the analogy for what God has done for us with the Holy Spirit. God has marked us as, uh, as his owners of us through the Holy Spirit acting as our seal then it's clear that you know, this work is not something the Holy Spirit does through uh, the representation of the Word as though the Holy Spirit himself is not actually in our hearts. He's not in our hearts, but he is represented in our hearts by the Word, so he's represented in our hearts by something other than himself. No, no. I mean, this passage says, and you put all of these passages about sealing together, and it's God who put the Holy Spirit in our hearts to act as this seal, as his mark of ownership of us. And the Holy Spirit will act as that seal until the day of redemption. And so this is not something that just first century Christians needed. This is something that every Christian needs. The Spirit is in our hearts, marking us as belonging to God until the day of redemption when Jesus Christ comes back and our bodies are redeemed. And so, you know, this is a passage that is just not consistent with that word-only view. It's only consistent with the idea that the Spirit himself personally is in our hearts. And, and you know, again, I believe that he only works in hearts that are under the influence of the Word of God, but he doesn't only work in their hearts through the Word of God. He does more. You know, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16 is just so clear. Paul prayed for the Ephesians, you know, that, um, uh, you know, he might give to you according to the riches of his glory with might to be strengthened through his spirit in the inner man. 
Now, you know, Paul prayed that for the Ephesians. Paul didn't just exhort the Ephesians, read your Bible more. Paul is telling the Ephesians what he prayed for them. And he prayed to God. He didn't give a command to them, read your Bible more. He prayed to God and he asked God, please God, strengthen them with might through your spirit in their inner man. And of course, if it was right for Paul to pray that for the Ephesians, then it was right for the Ephesians to pray that for themselves. That's why Paul's telling them about the prayer. And if it was right for them to pray that for themselves, then it's right for us to pray that for ourselves. And, you know, if Paul prayed that for them, you know, if Paul asked God to give them strength through his spirit in their inner man, then Paul thinks that there's something that he has to pray for that, you know, the word of God alone won't accomplish. He's got to pray, you know, in addition to just encouraging them to read their Bibles, he's got to pray and ask God to do something for them that won't be accomplished by the word of God alone. And so, uh, I mean, there's so much more that could be said, but I believe that the New Testament clearly teaches that the Spirit himself personally dwells in our hearts, and the Spirit in our hearts does something to influence us, to strengthen us. He, he has this spirit-on-spirit -spirit influence in our lives. But, but now let, let's move to the, to the third part of this video, and I want to talk to you about some of my concerns. Okay, so um, I want to be very honest. I mean, I think that the word-only view of the indwelling and work of the Holy Spirit is a really aberrant view. Now, I, I know where it comes from, um, and I appreciate the attitude that it grows out of, because, you know, it grows out of this restoration spirit that says, you know, I am not going to believe what I've been told just because I've been told it. Uh, rather, I'm going to go back to Scripture, and I'm going to examine everything according to the Scriptures, and I'm going to toss out all man-made traditions that can't be substantiated by Scripture. I'm not going to allow my conscience to be burdened by that. I'm not going to allow uh, my mind to be blinded by that tradition. I'm only going to believe, teach, and practice what's found in the New Testament. And so, you know, that spirit of restorationism ha has caused people to, to question uh, what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, especially in light of the fact that, you know, there have been some extreme traditions about what the Holy Spirit does in Calvinism and Pentecostalism. So I know the spirit out of which this word-only view concerning the indwelling and work of the Holy Spirit grows, and I appreciate that spirit. But I hope that that spirit will uh, that led people into this word-only view will also lead them out of this word-only view. Because I, I don't think it's a scriptural view, and I think it's a potentially dangerous view. But, you know, I don't think that the word-only view of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, is a fellowship issue provided that people uh, pray better than they preach. You know, as long as people continue to pray, like in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, God, please help me. God, you know, I need your strength. God, please enable me to overcome this temptation. Lord, help me to be more loving uh, to my wife and to my family and to my coworkers. Uh, as long as people are praying that, you know, even if they don't, pray that God strengthen them through the Spirit, or even if they don't understand that God answers that prayer through the Spirit, as long as they're living lives of dependence upon God through prayer, I don't think that, you know, this word-only teaching about the Holy Spirit is a fellowship issue. But, I mean, here's the problem. Some word-only teachers are becoming really consistent with that teaching. And that's the problem. It's the fact that some word-only teachers don't think that you should pray and ask God to strengthen you because they think the only help that God is going to give you is what you find in the pages of Scripture. In fact, in a preacher school, and I have heard this from a witness uh, of this statement, in, in a preacher school, there was a, a, uh, a man that, was a student in the preacher school and his wife was attending classes with him. 
And his wife has a sister who is same-sex attracted. And so she uh, asked in class if she could pray for her sister that God would give her sister strength to you know, overcome that sin. And the teacher in this brotherhood preacher school said, no, you should not pray for her. God will not give her strength to overcome the same sex attraction. That, that is not a legitimate prayer. And it upset the wife of that preacher student so much she began to sob in class. Now, I think that that is, that is heresy. That, that, is, that is false teaching to, to an extreme to tell people that they should not pray to ask God for help. You know, that is tantamount to discouraging someone from being baptized so that that person could be saved through what Jesus did for them. Discouraging someone from uh, accessing the resources that were available to them through the death and resurrection of Jesus. You see, pr uh, teaching that you shouldn't pray and ask God to give you the resources that he provides to give you strength to overcome sin and to live righteous lives. I mean, and, and, and discouraging someone from being baptized, I mean, that, that's the same sort of thing. That, that is dangerous, false teaching. And brethren, that, that needs to be opposed. This is a conversation that we need to have. There, there are some people who are saying, uh, you know, we, why are you talking about this? You're just causing problems by talking about this. No, no, this is a debate we need to have. G.H.P. Showalter, who uh, used to edit the uh, Firm Foundation, called Churches of Christ a wild democracy. And I think that that is a very fitting term. You know, we have no pope. And so we believe that every person has the right to go to Scripture and to uh, study for themselves and to be true to their own conscience. And, and the way that, um, you know, we as, as, as a brotherhood move from, from error to truth and the way that we, we hone our beliefs is through debate. And, and this is something that, that needs to be discussed and this is something that needs to be debated because brethren are being hurt when they think that the only help that's available to them is just in the pages of Scripture. And that is, that is discouraging brethren. And um, when they don't know that God is with them and, and that God is a, a ready resource to them and that God will give them strength. And, and I do think that asking God for that strength is a condition to getting the strength. I mean, we see Paul prayed for the Ephesians. And, you know, James says that if you you ask not, you have not, or you have not because you ask not. And so it's important that we understand what's available to us. And, you know, Paul didn't just say in Philippians 2 verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, I'm so thankful that God inspired Paul to write the next verse, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. <laughs> now you think about that. Think about what that's saying. God works in us to will. God will strengthen our will. Now, you know, we're not talking about God overriding our will. We're not talking about uh, irresistible grace as per Calvinism. No, no. But, but we see that there's the promise here that God will strengthen our will. I mean, it just said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says, God works in you to will. God will strengthen your will as you want to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then it says, God uh, works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He will give you that strength to work at your own salvation with fear and trembling. But that's something that we have to seek from him. And brethren have to know that. They have to know that God, through the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, is a ready resource to help them. And so I hope that you'll consider what's said in this video. And I apologize for the rambling nature of it. I mean, you know, again, this, my thoughts were, were really stated, uh, you know, in terms of my own personal journey, um, you know, as I, as I fought through this issue through the years, but, but I think that, that this is a debate that we need to continue to have. 
And I hope that these words are accepted in the spirit in which they're meant. They're not intended to harm. They're only intended to help. God bless you. Thank you for tuning into our video. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, be sure to leave a like on the video, share it with a friend, and leave a comment telling us how you liked the video. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content like this. Also, be sure to give us a follow on Facebook. We share lots of our content and we make many other posts over there. We're also on TikTok, and so if you want to follow us there, we're on there as well. All right, I hope everyone has a great day.